Greetings, everyone. My name is Priscilla Dowden White, and on behalf of the Office for Religious, Spiritual, and Ethical Life at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, I'd like to express our gratitude for your attendance and participation in today's event. I am Associate Professor of History at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and I'm also currently pursuing the Master of Divinity degree at Eden Theological Seminary. In partial fulfillment for that degree, I am fortunate in being able to do my third year contextual education practicum with the Office for Religious, Spiritual and Ethical Life, the acronym for which is ORISL, who is the sponsor of today's forum, Fight, Faith in the Fight, Organizing Interfaith and Secular Coalitions for Racial Equity and Justice. We are grateful for the two co-sponsors of this event, the Interfaith Youth Corps, and the Interfaith Partnership of Greater, Saint, of Greater St. Louis. We thank both of these organizations for their partnership and support of this event. In our discussion today, we will explore opportunities and challenges associated with interfaith organizing and anti-racism strategies on university campuses, in local communities and in our world. The central question underlying today's discussion is what role can an interfaith coalition play in the movement for racial equity and justice? Before we begin our discussion, I would like to present to you our co-moderator for this event, Micah Sandman, who will introduce herself and greet you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Micah Sandman. I'm a sophomore student at Washington University in St. Louis, studying religious studies um, in the College of Arts and Sciences. And um, I also work um, with the Office of Religious, Spiritual, Spiritual and Ethical Life. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Um, and so before we begin today's event, I would like to formally acknowledged the land of the indigenous peoples who have lived on this land since time immemorial, um, and specifically the Osage Nation, Otoy Missouri Nation, and Alini Confederacy, upon whose historical homeland our university is located. Washington University is a community of educators and learners from every corner of our globe and must acknowledge the land we currently occupy. We also re recognize that given the format of our virtual event, we may have folks watching from many different places, including outside of the St. Louis area. We encourage all of you who are tuning in today to reflect upon the land you are on. We invite all of you to please take a moment as you see fit after our discussion today to learn the names of the indigenous peoples on whose land you are situated today. Thank you, Micah. A word about our format uh, for our webinar. Micah and I have some questions we will be asking our panelists. As the panel, as the panel discussion is taking place, we want to encourage all of you who have joined us here today to write questions um, using the Q&A feature. We will attempt to address as many of your questions as possible later in this program. Um, it's our pleasure today to welcome and introduce our panelists. Joining us today for this conversation, um, we have Mr. Ibrahim Abdul-Mateen, who is an urban strategist, whose work focuses on deepening democracy and improving public engagement. He is the founder of Green Squash Consulting, which is a management consulting firm based in New York that works with people, organizations, companies, coalitions, and governments committed to equity and justice, and is the author of Green Dean, What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Planet. Mr. Abdul Mateen sits on the New York Advisory Board of the Trust for Public Land, as well as the International Living Future Institute, encouraging the creation of a regenerative built environment and Sapello Square, whose mission is to celebrate and analyze the experiences of black Muslims in the United States. Welcome, Mr. Abdul-Mateen. 
Reverend Tracy Blackman is the Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries for the United Church of Christ. She is proud and grateful to once served as pastor to both Simpson Chapel, Simpson Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church and Christ the King United Church of Christ. A member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Reverend Blackman holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Birmingham Southern College, a Master of Divinity degree and an honorary doctorate from Eden Theological Seminary. Time will not allow us to list the vast array of prestigious national honors and recognitions bestowed upon Reverend Blackman for her impactful public witness and community work. Her response in Ferguson to the killing of Michael Brown resulted in national and international recognition, gaining her many audiences spanning the breadth of the White House to the Carter Center to the Vatican. Reverend Blackman's re religious practice is rooted in principled discipleship lived out through congregational and community engagement. Welcome, Reverend Blackman. Also joining us today in our discussion is Dr. J.T. Snipes, who is Assistant Professor of Educational Leadership at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, prior to which he worked for over 12 years in higher education administration. Dr. Snipes' current research interest focuses on religion and spirituality in higher education, African-American co collegiate students, and critical race theory in education. He currently is completing, uh, he, he has recently rather, completed his award-winning dissertation entitled, Ain't I Black Too? Counter Stories of Black Atheists in College which explores the narratives of secular African-American students in college. His latest edited volume, Remixed and Reimagined Innovations in Religion, Spirituality and Interfaith in Higher Education invites readers to rethink religious scholarship and practice in higher education and student affairs. Welcome Dr. Snipes. And last but not least, we have joining us Reverend Dr. Zandra Wagoner, who holds a PhD in religious studies, is an ordained minister in the Church of the Brethren, and is the interfaith chaplain at the University of Laverne, Laverne in Laverne, California. As chaplain, she directs the multi-religious office of religious and spiritual life, supporting spiritual growth and well-being respect for religious and cultural differences, worldwide exploration, religious, spiritual, secular, interfaith skills and engagement, and practices of hope, peace, community, justice, and love. Reverend Dr. Wagoner teaches for the philosophy and religious religion department, including introductory courses in religion and specialized courses in the area of gender, sexuality, contemporary theology, interfaith cooperation, and the, inter and the environment and animals in the study of religion. She is actively involved in anti-racism efforts in her community and in the interfaith cooperation and in interfaith cooperation locally and nationally. Welcome Reverend Dr. Wagner. All right. We are so delighted to have all of you here today. It's so exciting um, and to be able to hear from you, um, to have your perspectives on what it means to organize religious and secular and interfaith coalitions for racial equity and justice. Um, so at this point, we're gonna transition into some of our prepared questions, um, if that's all right. So the first question that we're curious to hear from you today about is, from your perspective, what is the connection between interfaith work, racial equity and justice and coalition building? And in the work you do, how have you witnessed such coalitions in action? Um, so Reverend Blackman, would you be willing to, to start us out first? Absolutely. And um, thank you, Dr. Dowden White and to you, Micah, for inviting us into this panel and this conversation today. I'm looking forward to it and hearing from all of um, my esteemed panelists that join me um, here today. Uh, from my perspective, the connection between interfaith work and racial justice, racial equity work 
and um, injustice is is a human connection, right? Uh, do, it doesn't matter uh, how one chooses to live out one's faith or one's standard of values uh, outside of the definition of faith. We all are comprising groups of different ethnicities, different races, uh, different cultures. Um, and race is the intersection for most of the oppressions that are happening in the US today. And so uh, I find that no different in this conversation. Um, racial equity leads us into a way of being that recognizes at its core that everyone deserves to have what they need. Everyone deserves to have the space they need. Everyone deserves to have the freedom they need to live their lives as they see or deem fit. Um, and faith is no exception to that. So we intersect these things at the place of recognizing the, di the dignity of all humankind um, and the right to live fully and be fully present uh, for every humankind. And that is across um, methods of, um, of worship uh, that is across identities of, um, of frameworks of value around faith um, that is across economics, that is across everything. And so race always for me sits at that point of intersection. Um, justice uh, for me has its roots in the Hebrew word Siddiq. Uh, Siddiq, which is the same word used for righteousness and righteousness not in the pious form, um, that we often use it, but to say, to be in communion with a higher power and communion and relationship with those who are also on a level playing field of creation, right? So um, a vertical alignment and a horizontal alignment. And uh, I think that this is present across faiths as it is a present across all kinds of uh, identity factors. Thank you, Reverend Blackman. That is such a thoughtful answer. Um, Dr. Snipes, would you be willing to jump in? Um, you would have me go after such an eloquent missive <laughs> on that perspective. Um, let, let me see if I could add anything to, 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 to this conversation. Um, to, to be honest, I, I struggle with this question because uh, one of the things that I've been devoting my time to think about is is what does what does the term interfaith mean? Um, and I've been provoked by a colleague of mine, Rahul Deep, who's been asking that question uh, in terms of what 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 is interfaith um, this movement offering racial justice in particular? Um, and as someone that works on a college campus and has been trying to initiate interfaith um, work. Uh, one of the persistent challenges that I run into is a failure to recognize racial equity um, and justice work writ large. There's often, um, it, when I have authentic and honest conversations with my um, students, black students and uh, Latinx students, uh, interfaith is often racialized as something that white folks do. This is not something that is a part of our community. Uh, so th the thing that I am struggling with is how, how, did, how do these things become racialized? Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I, I can see a connection for my own life and my own experience. I did my undergraduate work at Baylor University, which is a Baptist university, a predominantly white institution. And I saw the work of, of justice uh, as deeply integrated into my faith and deeply integrated into my story. Um, so to think about interfaith and racial justice work as something separate or different entities just has never really made um, sense to me. But in working with IFYC, um, in working with interfaith organizations, there is um, there is an active conversation and there is active tension around can these ideas work together? Um, and as Reverend Blackman so eloquently stated, they 
they do go together. They, they, there is a connection. There is a human connection between these uh, ideals. So uh, I, I do think for me, I, I'm in a space of continuing to grapple with the, the impact of interfaith being constructed as a, a largely white space. Thank you, Dr. Snipes. I, I think that I'm really glad that you brought up that tension from the onset because um, interfaith work um, and communities spaces or is is often just explicitly it, well, if not explicitly, but just it's a it's a it's a white thing a lot of the time. Um, and I'm I'm really interested in those in those connections you've drawn to what Reverend Blackman was saying about um, this human question. Um, thank you, that was, thank you. Um, Mr. Abdul Mateen, I was wondering if you'd be able to jump in as well from a little bit of a different um, perspective with, with, um, with a different background. I was wondering if you'd be yeah. able to share. Happy to, I um, thank you so much and thanks for all the folks that have spoken so far. And welcome to everybody that's here. It's um, odd that we're not all in the same big, beautiful space and that there's not like a spread of some yummy food in the back and that the panelists didn't get to like sit down a coffee and before they hopped on and, you know, all the wonderful things that happen when you're in person. So we can just imagine those moments. Um, I, I really want to use this as a sort of to echo. the. It's a great moment to echo the work of a gentleman named um, Cecil Corbin Mark. And Cecil Corbin Mark was um, who recently passed. Um, he was young, he's in his 50s, if that, um, young man who was a mountain of action and leadership in the environmental justice community in New York City and in beyond. And the reason why I want to bring him up is that I was part of, when I was putting together Green Dean, what Islam teaches about protecting the planet, Cecil was part of a group that was from um, West Harlem Environmental Action called WE Act, WE Act for Environmental Justice. And Cecil was a main organizer for them and they were pulling together faith leaders for environmental justice. And it was one of the first times that I had been on an intentional space with an intentional group of people thinking about um, environmental justice issues, which essentially is, an, is a way to describe, in my opinion, um, an aspirational um, uh, response to environmental racism um, which really is code word for saying uh, one of the forms of institutionalized white supremacy. Um, we, we always let people off the hook, um, but white supremacy is a major problem and a lot of us don't necessarily call it out like we should. So this grouping, um, the Interfaith Leaders for Environmental Justice was really astonishing. It brought together people from all different um, parts, all different faiths, literally every faith you can imagine and we met regularly and we, we met seriously. We were really grappling with some serious issues that were that the city was also grappling with at the same time. Now, just to give you that context that the EJ community works in coalitions and alliances. So one of the largest, which is in New York is the Renews Coalition, which fought to get the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. That Climate Leadership and Com Community Protection Act at the, in New York state level is creating working groups that are looking at all of these issues and how they impact people of color particularly black communities in New York state. Um, but that framework and that approach is, is what's gonna be copied at the federal level. So to put this in context is that a lot of the organizing that started with black and brown folks in Harlem, folks that were connected to communities that were connected to their churches, connected to their mosques, um, all that work is being, is sort of, and, and the, the relationships that have been built over a long period of time is directly inputting how the work is happening as it goes forward. So it's no longer a few people in a small room. They're, they're forcing executives like Governor Cuomo and um, President Biden who have really sort of like, yeah, they're interested in environmental issues, but the frame of environmental justice is not gonna be their first thought, but now it has to be because politically the movement has moved forward. So the way that that looks in action is today in practice, building off the work of place-based work that of groups in Buffalo, New York and other places where they're really honing in on a neighborhood and focusing on those areas. The work that Cecil was doing now, they're to decarbonize our, our, our energy supply. One of the pilots that's happening in, across New York state is an effort to get um, gas burning stoves out of people's homes and give them state-of-the-art modern induction stoves 
primarily because we haven't even studied indoor air quality. And um, I work with a group called the Healthy Air Alliance, and we're looking at all the ways that air quality is a, a negative, bad air quality is, is affecting people's health. So I think all these, these, these issues connect, but when you put people of color at the center, you get pro you solve problems for everybody. And I think that, that that really is the crux of it here. Thank you. That is, I'm really glad that you're bringing, that you are bringing up the, the community lens um, and, and sort of, I think sort of understanding the different, um, live different levels and channels of society um, and, and the ways in which this, this kind of work and these different kinds of, um, of, of thoughts about, of, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, these, these ways in which navigating and, and pushing for racial equity and justice um, through the different channels of society um, from, from neighborhoods, from places, from communities, um, in universities. Um, it, it, it's, it's really, I'm really glad to have your perspective um, on that. Thank you, Mr. Abdul Mateen. Um, Reverend Dr. Wagner, would you mind rounding us out for this question? Thank you so much, Micah, and it's uh, just very special to be here today, and thank you so much for the invitation. So I, uh, similar to Dr. Snipes, uh, I work at a university, uh, it's a Hispanic and multicultural serving institution, and uh, when we began doing interfaith work, and that's part of my, my role, is to help interfaith coalition building on a college campus, right? It's, it's, great learning laboratory for this. And yet when we would take our students to national interfaith events, they were often the, the only black and brown people in the room. And, and it, this has been a learning process for me, um, but over time really understanding that without some intentionality that interfaith spaces will replicate and privilege whiteness, heteronormativity and privilege Christianity. So um, we really wanted to understand what we were doing well <clears throat> and, and also strengthen it so that we're really building a multiracial, multicultural interfaith coalition. And so uh, we did some research on this with our own students. We listened. Um, I'm going to read just two quotes from those uh, interviews that just uh, speak so clearly to this question <clears throat> about connecting interfaith work with uh, racial justice. So one student, uh, he's a Latino and uh, grew up Catholic. Actually, he says, I was uncomfortable with interfaith work because although I consider myself Catholic, I don't really practice it often. So it wasn't until I knew that they used the power of interfaith for social justice that it motivated me to get involved with interfaith work. Um, we heard this kind of statement over and over and over again. And so it, uh, our work at, at Laverne is always connecting interfaith with social justice, with racial justice, and we do this in very practical ways. <clears throat> we wanted to make sure that students can show up in authentic ways in interfaith spaces without sacrificing or ignoring essential parts of their identity. So this meant that we began to embed in our interfaith leadership development exposure to critical theories like intersectionality and um, black feminist thought and critical race theory and many, many, many others. So that those who are involved in this interfaith coalition building work are also adept at noticing and analyzing how race and class and gender, sexuality, nationality and history have an impact on interfaith spaces. We encourage students to engage in their own identity development and spiritual development and to learn community organizing and to practice navigating difficult uh, conversations and situations while also honing some of these 
uh, interfaith skills, <clears throat> excuse me, associ associated with bridge building and relationship building. Just a second. <clears throat> I think this is my own nervousness. My throat is saying. <laughs> um, so uh, what, I, what I would just want to say is it, it takes effort, intentionality to make sure that interfaith spaces remain truly liberatory and multiracial. Um, and when we build that capacity, the interfaith coalitions are amazing. And I've seen it again and again and again on my campus community. And I'm just gonna mention one because part of your question was about an example. Um, so I'll just mention one. Um, one of our most significant coalitions was built a few years ago when we had race-based threats on our campus against black and brown students. Our interfaith leaders who by this time were very well versed and comfortable talking about racism, were able to, and they were asked to address our entire campus community as representatives of the student voice and, and made calls for change that really did lead to some campus transformations. But it's all over time and building that kind of capacity so that those coalitions can be trustworthy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Wagner. Um, and I am so glad to that we are able to draw that line between what Dr. Snipes was saying about, um, about interfaith spaces defaulting to whiteness and about having to bring true intentionality um, and critical theory. I love that you uh, bring that up and draw those examples from your um, from students on your own campus um, because it takes incredible intentionality and a commitment to um, to to honoring difference and and not not forcing students to dilute or um, compromise in any way to make those spaces. Um, have integrity. So um, thank you all for such thoughtful answers to, to begin us. And I'm gonna um, turn it over to So uh, the next question that I'd like to explore uh, is are there points of shared belief or understanding that atheists as an agnostic, secular humanist and- Priscilla, can you mute yourself and, and unmute? You have, we're having problems understanding you. Okay. Okay, is it better? No, it's not. Michael, can you ask a question? Sure, I'm so sorry, Priscilla. Um, um, so the next question is, are there points of shared belief or understanding that atheists, agnostics, secular humanists, and people of various religious faith um, can unify around in the movement for racial equity and justice? And, and what are some of those ways in which we can work to create heterogeneous spaces um, on or off campus for interfaith coalition building? Um, so Dr. Snipes, I think Priscilla had had wanted to begin with you um, because of the work that you were. Yeah, I, I, I'm very appreciative for the question. Um, so uh, as was shared in my bio, I did my dissertation research looking at the experiences of Black atheists in college. And one of the, the interesting things for me is, is that my participants sat at the intersection of two separate communities. And oftentimes their, their experience on campus and being in higher education student affairs, we're really excited about creating intentional spaces for student development. And what was happening is that all of the spaces for their quote unquote black development were um, Christ Christocentric. They would consistently get asked questions about um, what church do you go to, right? And, and, um, and, and, and there are colloquialisms that I adopted and, and thought, that these are black culture colloquiums. So saying something like, you know, God has got you, he gonna look out for you. It's something that I drew off of to provide encouragement um, that, that just didn't resonate with my, with, with my students 
particularly my black secular students in the ways in which I thought it was, would. Um, and then, so, you know, black student union, these black organizations are often steeped in what I would call at times white Christian supremacy. Um, and then on the other side, you have secular organizations uh, that that often don't have a consciousness around uh, racial justice and racial equity work. I think that's changing, uh, obviously, with what has happened over this past summer in the summer of 2020 um, with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and, um, you know, we could go on and on with the the heightened consciousness that has um, happened as a result of all of of all of these tragic incidents, um, I I was fortunate in the beginning of January. There's an organization actually here in St. Louis called Black Nonbelievers Inc., and the goal of that organization is to um, one just very simply let Black folks know that if you don't believe in God, that there is a space for you. Um, and, and, and there is a history attached to that space. So one of the things that my participants talked to me about, um, there's actually a, a documentary um, on PBS that talks about um, Black is and Black ain't. And what it, the, the series talks about the things that Black folks don't do. And one of the videos is uh, Black folks don't do atheism. And when I was preparing to, to do my dissertation, I, I remember very fondly the conversation I had with my mom. She was like, that's not something that we do. I, I'm, I'm happy that you created this intellectual framework and it's, it's really compelling, but atheism is not a part of, of black communities. And one of the things that I've always struck by, from my participants is that they're able to name that intellectual history and tradition of black secular folks. So they'll draw from Zora Neale Hurston, they'll draw from W.E.B. Du Bose, they'll draw from uh, Nella Larson as figures of, of black secularism um, to root them firmly within black culture. Um, so to answer the question, I, I think one of the practical things, there there on many campuses, there are student secular alliances. And these organizations often are overwhelmingly white. And I have the opportunity to speak at, uh, they have a summer conference. And my challenge to student secular organizing efforts on campus is to, to be in solidarity, racial solidarity with um, black communities on campus. Because uh, the question that these organizations will ask me is, how do we get more black students to participate? And my, my response is to say, to, to understand the issues that black students are facing on this campus and to stand with them in those issues. Where are the, the secular students for black lives is the question that I raise to, to, to these students um, and pushing them to, to think about that work. And then within predominantly black organizations, so within black student union, um, really challenging the the notion of Christian hegemony that all Black folks are Christian, uh, we're not, and and helping create a space with within the Black Student Union for Black Muslims, for Black atheists, for for Black Catholics, for Black Jews. Um, let's reimagine um, our spaces and and create uh, more inclusive spaces on both ends. That, um, that, that just, I mean, raised so many incredible, um, points about, <laughs> about, about, um, about Christian hegemony, about Black experience in the United States, about, um, about university settings, about, I mean, as a, as a student myself, um, what it means to, like, meaningfully in, make heterogeneous spaces, racially diverse, racially multi, racially, um, um, racially um, diverse spaces uh, um, to actually do that with, with real intentionality is the word that we keep coming back to. But um, yeah, what an answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Sipes, um, 
Priscilla, do you want to see if your audio is working again? Okay, can you hear me now clearly? Yes. Okay, great. I, you know, I thought for a second that was the creator trying to protect my voice because I have a sinus infection and some a drainage going on on here, but uh, good. So uh, Mr. Abdul Mateen, would you like to follow up on that question as well? Yeah, that's a great. Um, you know, the first thing that jumped in my head with that was uh, the other day I was, I was, I went for a hike with some friends and these are like, um, you know, these fancy photographers and, and branding and marketing people that I, I don't work with, but they're just my buddies. Um, and we were just joking and one, two, me and this other guy realized that we knew someone in common. And it was like someone that I love dearly, someone that he loves dearly. Um, and so um, I was like, how do you know her? Uh, how, how do you, you know, his daughter plays with her daughter. They live in Portland. It's just like all different worlds. And I was like, well, I know her from the, you know, the Muslim community uh, in, in the Bay Area. So a couple years back, I lived in the Bay Area. I was, um, and I was a part of a small group actually of folks that were from all over the globe, really, that were really trying to rediscover their Islam as people who were raised Muslim and sort of didn't drift so far that we didn't want to be Muslim. We drifted and then we found people that reflected us at that moment in time. So we found people who met us where we were at. And so we created a little family. And that family, I, I still consider those people like, like super tight and close and I love them to death. And then he had one of our, co our friends that was there with us. He's like, how do you know him? He's like, oh yeah, I know him from the Muslim community in Chicago, um, the Inner City Muslim Action Network and the work that's happening in Chicago around at the intersection of all these issues around racial justice and interfaith work um, in the South side of Chicago. And my buddy was like, oh, where's the atheist community? <laughs> where's, the, where's my atheist crew? It's like, he started joking because he didn't have that, res that didn't resonate for him. So I just was laughing that, you know, that that, that that exists. I think the place that we have in common, right, is an agenda for right now. It's not like, we don't have to agree on anything. This is the key thing that people get stuck on is constantly wanting to, convince people like a lot of interfaith work ends up being uh it sounds like the beginning of a joke you know it's a priest or a rabbi an imam walking to a blank and then you know they start talking about the nature of god we don't have to have that conversation in 2021 what we have to do is decarbonize our economy we have to ban single-use plastics we have to save what's left in the natural world the soil is hurting and it's crying out for us to we are intended to be the gardeners of the planet Earth, right? We're intended. We're not. We're not intended to destroy. We're, we're intended to work with the the Earth in a in a way where literally our role is, and our function is the gardeners. Human beings often think that our sheer existence is poison, but actually, by design, by the creator of the universe, our existence is when we recognize it, it's in a beautiful balance with the natural world. And as a part of that, not only save what we have left but healing scarred earth. If our agenda is to heal scarred earth, do we have a lot of conversation about what we believe in? Or do we focus on getting to work? That to me is the thing that keeps resonating for me. I think we have to recognize that technology has its limits. One of the reasons why the Islamic world did not advance throughout the Middle Ages where this sort of hit a sort of point where it seemed like it, the, the Western world shot up is that in the Islamic world, they started to think, is technology pulling us away from God, away from that, re like re reflecting on God and on, on the reality of, of creation? And maybe the technology that you use should be, we didn't have the language for it, but it should be regenerative, like that gardener framework. We should be able to heal the earth and can heal our connections and come closer together with technology. Not, well, we can do it. Oh, we can try it. Oh, look, I can make a lot of money off it. I think that that's the agenda that we've had. We've had an extractive agenda. And I think everybody can get on board on a humanist agenda. Humanist meaning we support each other so that each of us can thrive. And I think that, that that's what really drives me right now is thinking of how do we do that? And I think one of the other pieces of that is re of the restorative and regenerative pieces of that is that there's new models of ownership that we can explore. There's new ways that people can make money and share benefit from our changing in this new direction. And the reality is that some of the old people, what we may frame as the 1% will no longer exist. 
And that is the hard part that we have to get over. Are we more connected to the idea that there's an, a, a, of that gross imbalance or do we recognize the sort of beauty that the creator of the universe has put in or just the beauty of nature that there's enough for all of us? I feel like saying amen right now and passing the collection plate. <laughs> um, Reverend Blackman, I am certain that you have something to share with us on this, this question. You know, Dr. Don White, I found this question to be most intriguing because it forced me to think about um, most of my forays into interfaith work. Um, and I can't speak for other people's context, but mine has been even when people talk about interfaith, they're really only talking about Abrahamic faiths. Um, it is not the vast array of, of expressions of, of how one may understand the, the, God, uh, the God that they serve or any other type of um, expressions. And so within this wide range of ethical traditions, religious traditions coexist with secular value frameworks such as humanism and utilitarianism and others. We all have value frameworks. Some refer to them as morals that shape our perception of right or wrong. For some, that framework is derived from texts the community holds as sacred. And for others, that framework is derived from various readings and experiences. And for even others, their frameworks are set internally. However one arrives at the framework, what is relevant to me in this conversation is that we all have one. <laughs> and it is my belief that the vast majority of those frameworks include affirmations of dignity for all humankind in harmonious relationship with creation. I want to, um, you know, kind of piggyback on what Mr. Abdul Martin was saying. We differ widely how we get there, but we all get there. <laughs> And I suggest that any effort to craft heterogeneous space for coalition work might begin at this place of commonality. Uh, the faith belief narrative in this country must shift from a focus of how we differ in expression to what common values do we hold and how might we work in tandem if not in unison toward those goals. Um, I know that this conversation is about interfaith, but uh, I am still reeling um, from what happened in this, in this nation over the last four years. And I'm not attaching that just to who was the president. I don't think it's over, but just the entire um, ethos of our nation uh, became severely divided. And faith was one of the tools that did that. Um, I have been to a lot of services that deem themselves interfaith. I've been to only a few interfaith services, <laughs> if you understand what I mean by that. Um, and, and one of the closest that I went to was in Charlottesville, right before the alt-right rally, where we actually had a, a collective gathering that was not um, Christian with a guest rabbi, right? It was, it was an interfaith service where everyone uh, had the space to, to worship or to speak. It wasn't all worship. Some of it was just poetry. Some of it was just reading um, and saying, we are all here because what we think, what we are anticipating will happen tomorrow is wrong. And that's why we're in this space. <laughs> we happen to be in this space that is a church because it's the largest space we have. And everyone had a chance to express themselves in the way they felt called to express themselves and to invite the whole room into that. So we actually, you know, did Buddhist chants and we had, um, you know, rabbis who, who um, sang and, and did scripture from Hebrew texts. And we had Christian expressions and we had Baha'i and we had Buddhist and, and everyone, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever experienced, right? <laughs> and it was an educational experience as well as um, um, just an emotional experience. And it happened because 
we had a common goal. Uh, for us, that goal that day was not the creation narrative, which is a very compelling goal. I, I absolutely agree with that. We None of us are gonna make it if we don't get this act together with creation. Um, that was around uh, presenting a solid, a solid front against what we knew would be actions of white supremacy the next day, right? But what sticks with me about it is that we actually made space. We didn't require people to think alike, to act alike, to be alike, to be recognized in the fullness of human dignity and respected for who they were and how they came. Um, and I wrestle a little bit with the notion in, in these conversations of simply calling it white supremacy. Uh, because white supremacy for me sometimes lets Christianity off the hook. Um, and Christianity in interfaith spaces can be as oppressive <laughs> as white supremacy is when we're just talking race. I know it's not that clear cut of a division, um, but it, it is problematic um, that we don't, um, <laughs> We don't interspace, well, let me say it this way and then I'll be quiet about it because I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with it. But, you know, when I look across the gamut of faiths, um, Christianity is the most demanding and the least um, forgiving. And I don't mean in acts of piety or the expression of the faith. I mean, in making room to honor that perhaps there are other ways. Christianity requires absolute faithfulness. Christianity says there's only one way, right? Um, and so it makes it hard for, for Christians to actually engage authentically in interfaith work. And that's true no matter what race. Um, you all may disagree with me, and I certainly can hear disagreement, but um, this question arrested me the most because I agree that the way we get this work done is to rally around the things that we agree about. And the thing we agree about is not the conversation we want to have. And often it is Christianity that requires the other conversation first. That's what I'm trying to say, right? The litmus test is where do you stand on this, this, and this? And then if we can have agreement here, I'm willing to go further with you. And I'm saying that it is Christianity that has the greatest shift to make, to say, we can work on these things even if we don't agree on all things. Well, you not only tried to say it, but you said it so powerfully, Reverend Blackman. And um, there's so many follow-up questions that I, I know Micah was thinking about and I'm thinking about as, as well. And perhaps we'll be able to go back to this question um, in, the, in the question and answer period where the attendees will, will join in this, this question. You know, one thing that keeps coming to mind as I listen to Reverend Blackman and to Mr. Abdul Mateen is intentionality in the way we, we organize. Mm -hmm. We're going to um, ask another question now and uh, after that, we will open up this discussion uh, for more questions from those who uh, are attending our webinar today. Our final question for now is how can interfaith communities and organizations effectively center anti-racism in their work and in the project of interfaith? Are there any strategies in particular which come to mind? And I'd like to uh, first pose that question to Reverend Dr. Rep. Wagoner. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I actually want to um, start my response to this question from what uh, Reverend Blackman has just shared. Um, so um, interfaith spaces, because of exactly what has already been shared, right? It has this habit of going towards whiteness and going toward Christian sort of values and assumptions. So even as that interfaith space, like it so wants to get to the shared values, <laughs> like it wants to jump there so quickly. And so one of the strategies that I think is so important in interfaith spaces is to first be carving out some space for real difference um, as we create these coalitions for racial justice. So in other words, if we hope to really have a heterogeneous space, we can't get to shared values too quickly. I mean, obviously there are those humanistic values and we wanna affirm that. Uh, but if we get there too quickly, we'll skip over the crucial differences of who has power and privilege, where there's systemic racism or discrimination showing up in the space. It will miss where the historical trauma is and where we need to make connections around that. Um, we might miss where there needs to be healing. So uh, we kind of have this uh, strategy or practice at, in my context, uh, we call it counter space, where uh, we're, we're inviting people to bring their, narr their, their own narratives and lived experiences that uh, don't necessarily replicate the dominant narrative um, in interface spaces. Uh, so that's just one strategy we're, we're using. Um, some other things uh, that we do, I've already mentioned some, some of it is, is around that educational piece of having uh, good critical theories. Um, there's also uh, a need to uh, do education on whiteness. Whiteness affects everyone and just making sure everyone understands what that is and how it affects us. Um, for me personally, and when I work with uh, people who identify with white, I, there is this great resource. It's just a few pages and it's called The Characteristics of White Supremacy Culture. And it's just this list of what white normative values look like. And it's a really good place for reflection. Uh, in creating an anti-racist interfaith coalition. Um, we also do uh, like we do seminars, workshops on how do you have difficult conversations about race. Um, we've also just this year because of this incredible book, My Grandmother's Hands, that is really registering how racism is living in our bodies, right? So what's the body work we need to do in order to do this anti-racism work um, that's trustworthy? Um, and then always, whatever we're learning, whatever uh, connections that we're making, how do we turn it into an action, into something that matters? Um, and because anti-racism work really isn't much of anything unless it has some S something that comes from it. So those are just some ideas. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Um, Dr. Snipes, would you like to share on that question? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give a plug for an upcoming webinar that uh, Zandra and I are going to be featured on. And as a teaser, one of the things that has captivated my thinking recently is around placemaking. Uh, and I think particularly about offices of religious and spiritual life on campus. And whether we like to acknowledge it or not, there are particular ways in which these offices make a space, a physical space, right now we're existing in a virtual space, um, right? Um, but they take this physical space and imbue it with social meaning and it becomes a place for particular people. And too often 
the the spaces that are set aside for religious and spiritual life make it a place for Christian students, right? That's who this place is for. And it's very clear and it's very obvious. And I think some of the work that, that those of us that serve in higher education have to do is think about how we've constructed a place. Who is this most comfortable for? Who chooses to come here and why? And I think um, understanding some of the ways in which we have constructed this place, whether intentionally or unintentionally, um, I think about the work of scholars who are thinking about placemaking. Um, there's a, a, a chapter that came out recently from um, Anton, and I'm gonna slaughter his last name, I apologize in advance, of uh, Tikchevich. And in it, he talks about placemaking for, for um, black students in higher education. Uh, and I think we have to think about what are the, the steps that we make spaces for um, the beloved community that we envision. How is this a place, not just for Christian students, our Office of Religious and Spiritual Life? How does this become a space um, for a place for all of our students um, with different religious and secular values? Um, so thinking about the history is a component of it. Um, so how, place be, how spaces become place, history is a really important feature of it. Um, and then the social dynamics that exist within the space. So um, there are aesthetics that, that shape religious and spiritual spaces. Who, do the, who does those aesthetics speak to? What group does this aesthetic speak to? Um, and being able to name that uh, are ways in which we can begin to deconstruct a place solely for Christian students and, and recreate it into a, a truly interfaith or um, multi-faith uh, place. So Reverend Blackman, would you like to address that question too about anti-racism strategies? Um. <clears throat> I don't think I want to add anything to that. Um, I'm sitting here um, listening and um, learning and engaging and affirming what I'm hearing. Um, and I find myself asking internally whether or not we have shared um, understanding of the purpose of interfaith mm -hmm. um, gatherings. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of sitting with that with racism, right? Um, if one, if the purpose of interfaith gatherings um, is to learn to worship together um, then that's one thing. If the purpose of interfaith gatherings is to acknowledge and respect the broad diversity of ways to have personal expression, that's another. Um, and I think I just want to sit with it for a, a little bit. Because um, I, I don't enter interfaith relationships with the anticipation that we will ever um, be on one accord in worship, <laughs> but more that we will create space for however anyone wants to be. Um, and that's important to me in terms of, even in terms of the racial dynamics of it, that's important to me. So I'm just going to sit with that for a minute. Um, and I'm not asking anyone to address it. It's just where my head is right now. Um, yeah, I, and, I think we can all appreciate uh, that. And, and it took me back to um, something that Mr. Uh, Abdul Mateen said that we need an agenda for now. And so if we think about um, 
inter interfaith organizing around a an agenda for now, and and then we can talk about what that agenda is. Um, perhaps that's where where we we need to to start. Um, I, I agree with you. It's um, it's problematic if we think about interfaith organizing and coalition building from the perspective of uh, we want to be on all accord in terms of our faith beliefs. I don't think that. Uh, yeah, I and I'm not saying that anyone's saying that. I'm just saying. No, I'm I, I, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah, but yeah. I think I do think that there that that is I'm glad that you said it, Reverend Blackman, because I think that that is an underlying um, that, there, that that's an underlying requirement that some people think that we have to have. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, it's, it's most, most of the time it's unspoken. No one says that, no one comes to the conversation, no one comes to the activity um, voicing that, but often it's underlying. Well, and it, it comes up particularly around prayer, right? How do I pray a prayer that reaches everybody? Is that really the goal? But I, I'm going to sit that there. I, so what I want to say about the racism thing, uh, Dr. Dowden White, and it's the only thing I think I want to say about it is, um, you know, racism exists in interfaith space because racism exists in all of our face. <laughs> like, Absolutely. before we get Absolutely. to before we get to interfaith, right, we have to deal with racism in whatever expression we're in, we find it, right? We find it in Christianity, we find it in Islam, we find it in Judaism. Racism is there. Racism is there across the board. And that's why I started by saying it is the point of intersection no matter what we do. So it, it's, you know, it's not realistic to expect that if we haven't dealt with that in our own community, that when we put all the communities together, somehow we're not gonna, we're not gonna have it. We shouldn't be surprised. I mean, I don't know. What do you all think about that? No, <laughs> absolutely. I wanna bring Mr. Abdul Matini in on this question. I'm, I'm just like, uh, I'm loving your, um, the direction that you brought us, uh, Reverend Blackman. Uh, you really kind of anchored the conversation with that honesty um, and that sort of like humbleness and, and reflection. <clears throat> I think the, the things that I keep thinking about, the amount of times that I've walked into places that are um, of faith and I haven't, one basic simple thing that people could do is to acknowledge that there's other ways to express prayer. And I think when you anchored it with prayer, um, creating space, like when you go to a, any airport in most countries in the world, there's, there, there's a, pr a prayer space or a prayer room and they create space for all different faiths to do that. Now, obviously it's definitely the Abrahamic faith and there could be more space created. So I think that that's one of the places we've already, we've reevaluated bathroom orient or organization, right? It doesn't, it makes sense to have, if you, if you need to go to the bathroom, you should be able to go wherever there's an open stall and it should close behind you and not have some weird holes in the bottom. Like that seems like a rational direction that we're moving in, right? And I think we should really, really think, think through, um, like for example, like a, um, a rest stop on the freeway. If you go to a lot of places in the Muslim world, there's always a place to pray because we have five times of prayer a day. But you go to a rest stop in the United States and it's a place to shop, a place to go to the bathroom and you better get your butt out there. Why don't we have that kind of space all over the places, places for people to just sit and contemplate. And I think that that is the core of the conversation. When I walk into any hotel room, there should be an, a, an arrow for the Qibla, which is the direction to pray, to pray for Muslims. And if you do that, you automatically, people will feel that they're anchored and feel safe. Um, the last thing I want to say, I know that we're running low on time, but I had mentioned earlier some, some broad ideas around decarbonizing and, and, and single-use plastics. Let's put it this way. If all of, we had a blackout in 2003, and we have a blackout now in lots of places in Texas and other places in the, in the country right now. All of the houses of worship, the mosques, the synagogues, the temples, any place that is a place of worship, 
should be should be places of light in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a blackout. How do we get there? How do we get to a place where every single house of worship, every single place that is a place of prayer where people praise has is completely brilliantly lit in the midst of a blackout. And the way that we get there is through working together and understanding those connections and, and, break, and, and breaking through some silos. But that should be the goal, that when there's nothing else and there's no other light and there's no other place to go, you have a place of refuge and everybody can go to those places of refuge. The second thing is this idea of making deserts bloom again. We have all these places around the globe where deserts have been destroyed by war and by, by you know, the excesses of capitalism and extraction. Places of how communities of faith should come together and heal scarred land and make deserts bloom again. We can do that all over the country, all over the world. And that should be our, that could be our, our you know, getting folks that are Christian and Buddhist and Ifa and Candomblé and Islam and the Native American traditions out there working the land together, all those conversations that you described, we need to just get some work in. We need to put work into the ground. I, and, and, and I swear to you, there was this, I, I wrote a, a piece about a Christian brother and I, we, we, we did some hiking in, um, in uh, California 20 years ago almost now. And we, he was Christian and practicing and I was Muslim and practicing. And he was like, I don't agree with you. I don't like your faith and I don't like Muslims but we were on this trip together. And I remember I was just like, listen, we're the biggest guys on this trip. We're gonna have to carry the water when it gets heavy. When everybody, when nobody wants to carry the water, we're gonna be carrying the water. And when nobody was able to navigate, we were the ones navigating. And it was the creator that set it up that way, right? Someone, someone said to me, you know, I really like you. I really want you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior. And why did she say that? Because she wants me to go to heaven. And I said to her, you know what? We might be sitting there on the same side when, when, when it all comes down and God might be saying, look, look, y'all are on the same side. And we don't even know. We have no idea. So I think part of it is basically, let's get off our judgment pedestal and acknowledge and get to work. I swear to God, we have to get to work. We have to do some physical action together, particularly the young people on college campuses. Where can you be in service of the community? Forget about your agenda. Forget about what you want to learn. Forget about your branding or your personal identity. All that stuff is garbage. Go out into the community and put some work in. And that's where I think it starts. I love the image that you put in my mind of um, light all over the world from places where people right? it's, gather. It makes me, it makes me happy. <laughs> well, thank you, Carolyn, so much for for engaging that question. And now in um, the few minutes that we have remaining, we want to, to get to a question or two that our um, attendees today have been placing in the Q&A. So Micah, I'm going to, to turn this over to you now. Sure, so the question that was asked, um, was what is the current role of interspiritual community in economic development? What should that role look like? And what is the difference between the current role and what the role should look like in economic development? Um, and I'm just gonna offer that up for whoever wants to. I mean, I have lots of ideas. I'll jump in whenever you guys want. So I'll just say, well, not lots of them. I have one primary one. I think that we have to rethink ownership structures. Um, and I think that we have, um, there's a lot of examples throughout a lot of our traditions, but one thing that the, the, um, the Pope's encyclical on the environment some years ago did was that it, 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 incredibly, his audience was not Christians. His audience was humanity, right? And one of the things he did in that encyclical is that he critiqued, critiqued capitalism very directly. Now, other groups of faith traditions did not do that. And I thought it was like a missed opportunity. Um, and one of the things that part of that critique of capitalism is saying that there, if you, if you create a system where only wealth lands into the hands of a few, that is not, the, that was not the mission of Jesus. That was not the goal. And that was where we need to rethink that. And I think that system, like for example, there's projects in New York City where communities of color have organized to get um, solar power that is then going to be 
a benefit, literally a financial benefit is gonna go to the people in the local communities. And communities that are uh, of faith can organize themselves to sort of organize that community solar approach where not only are they getting savings in their energy, but they actually get physical money in their accounts. To me, that those are the types of things that we need to move towards, where people not only there's this healing and there's money and there's benefit from actually doing the right thing. I think that's the future. And I think the communities of have an incredibly strong role. And right now we have a Catholic president. We need to lean in on that. We need to lean in on that encyclical and make sure that he understands that, that, that making these types of changes can, can directly speak to his Catholic. Like you can critique capitalism from the White House in a really subtle, smart way that means benefits for all. So this is a very narrow um, example, but over the last two days, there was a documentary on the black church. Um, and one of the things that, that stuck out to me um, as I think back over the last two days was a comment made um, by a very popular minister uh, who doesn't need to be named here. It's just a comment that matters. Uh, and we were talking, the, the, the conversation in the, in the um, documentary was talking about the shifting of the black church and the purpose of the black church now versus the black church then. And this pastor said um, that the church had to shift because if people are no longer hungry, then you don't need to be preaching a gospel that's geared for hungry people. If people no longer need jobs or need help with housing or need help with cars, then you need to be preaching something else because you have to preach where people are and not where they were. And what, what troubled me about that was that in just those few lines, that person revealed that, um, that his context of, of um, congregation and humanity was limited to those whom he cared about, those whom he was in relationship about, with, right? Clearly one cannot say there's no one hungry <laughs> and no one can say there's no one not worried about shelter if one looks at humanity as a whole. And so when I, what I think that interspiritual communities have to do is get out of our own boxes and understand that whatever our understanding is of a divine, of a higher power, or of a higher calling from within, that it is a calling to the whole world. <laughs> it is not a calling just to our little corner that we have uh, warded and nurtured and look back and say, oh, look, they're doing well. That unless the whole world is doing well, and that is even outside of the United States, unless the whole world is doing well, then none of us are doing well. And so what I see are fiefdoms, no matter what, no matter how you cut it up. And what I hope for is a reorientation through all of our lenses into the world as a connected community <laughs> that is interrelated and interdependent. So that even those who have, when they give, understand that the giving is not on behalf of others, <laughs> but it is on behalf of their own liberation <laughs> and their own survival. Um, and we have a long way to go before we get that. And uh, again, it's not to denigrate that particular minister last night, but it slapped me in the face just like this to say, who thinks that there aren't hungry people, you know, when we added 6.8 million people to unemployment last month? Who thinks that? Who thinks that everyone has a house? So I don't need to talk about how we're going to shelter people. Hmm. Who thinks that everyone has food when we have so much of our land and environment that has been poisoned? Wow. I, I want to say beyond repair, but I think uh, my brother would jump on me if I say beyond repair, but <laughs> has been poisoned so that you can't even 
have community gardens without shipping in dirt and lifting up platforms to plant in. So I want to see us go to an economic, to a theological understanding, whatever that theolo theology is, is that we have responsibility for the whole world <laughs> and not just for the people directly connected to us. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, we only have time for one final question, unfortunately, but given the enthusiasm that I see around this discussion, I'm hoping that this will be the first of a future discussion such as this that we will have. Our final question comes from a Buddhist priest who says that she moved to St. Louis about six years ago, partly to open a new Zen meditation center. Before coming to St. Louis, she expected to have much more contact with people of color and have hoped to share the Zen Buddhist teaching and practice with them. But very few people of color have visited our center. Do you have any advice about how to reach out and attract people of color to our center? And I will open that question up for any of the panelists who would like to reply. I, I just wanna, if you don't mind, I have, uh, I can hold off and wait, uh, JT, if you have thoughts or. Well, uh, Reverend Dr. Zandra uh, had her. Oh, sorry. I think she Please. was about to speak first. Please, so. she could chime in. Uh, All right, and then we'll we'll come back around. Thank you. Uh, this is just from my experience at at my university. Uh, if if I am hoping that uh, a diversity of students are participating in spiritual life or in interfaith work. Um, I really spent my first two years there just being in other people's spaces. So I was at the Black Student Union and the Latino uh, Student Forum, and I went to our queer students spaces, and I just was there present, um, participating in their efforts, um, learning. So part of, I, I think, creating uh, spaces when we want to have other people be part of our spaces, I think often it's, it's first being in, in other people's spaces and creating a sense that, again, I keep using this word trustworthy, but it's so foundational to whether or not we will be in each other's spaces. And, and learn from each other. So anyways, that's one, one thought I had is, is uh, making sure that we are out there on the streets with people, with uh, other organizations. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Snipes or Mr. Abdul Mateen. I don't, I don't have much to add beyond what, what uh, Sandra shared. Um, but I will say, I've been serving on our institution's board for, um, and we have a task force dedicated to anti-racist work. And our institution ha has been trying to diversify the faculty, trying to diversify the staff, trying to diversify students in terms of race. And I... I've been asking a, a simple question, um, why? And I know there's a, there's a ready-made answer for that. Well, it's good for us to be a diverse institution. And what I've been trying to, to get my colleagues and push myself to think about is oftentimes, it, it, at least in the university setting, um, I know speaking about black students, we're often framed as a problem, right? That needs to be solved or fixed. So we're gonna bring them here, we're gonna give them an experience and we're going to transform them. And what I'm 
pushing my institution to think about is what value do you see in these populations? What do you know about them? Um, and how can you in then invite them into the space? Um, so adding, what, adding on to what Zandra has shared is this notion of um, building community. It, it's, it's not super complex. It is super complex and simple all at the same time. How do we create these communal spaces for multiple folks? I would, I would add really quickly that there's like practical things. Um, and I, I really appreciate everything you guys have both said. I, I do think there's always this, this notion of like, I'm gonna share this amazing thing with you um, and make sure you get it. Um, so there's that, 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 that's troublesome somewhat, but um, just this notion of like feeding people regularly. Um, there was a, um, there's a group in Charlottesville, interesting that you bring up Charlottesville but there's a, a, a Sufi community, a Muslim community in Charlottesville that every Sunday night they meet and they have a dhikr, which is basically like a, 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 a ritual of remembrance and recite, reciting Quran and verse and just being together. But the primary thing is that they feed everyone every Sunday night and you come as you are, come whoever you are, however you are, you can come and get a meal. And then afterwards we do the dhikr. So you can come for the meal and then leave and no one has any judgment. So I would offer that the, that, that, that the person who's opening that Zen Buddhist center, just feed everybody and open that up. It might be one person for a year, it might be two people for the next year, but that's really the practice. That's the, it's just the same thing with all of our practices. You know, people will say, well, I'm praying. How come God isn't answering my prayer? We'll pray for like five years straight and see what happens. See how you transform instead of what God is trying to, you want God to do for you. Um, you have to put it into work. So I think that that's like the baseline is just being present and being consistent. People want consistency. People want to see that you're there and you're not just going to like cut and run when things get, get hectic for you. Thank you so much. As we wrap up, we'd like to ask um, each of you to share with us what is helping to sustain you at this current moment. Um, what, is, what is helping to sustain you right now uh, through through this moment? I'll start and just quickly say it's it's my community. Um, I, I've, I feel honored to be a part of this virtual gathering. This is um, this has been a, a blessing for my soul. Uh, it, it, today was a pretty pretty harsh day for me. I, when we got on the call, uh, I'm from Texas and my and my relatives and family have been going through it. Um, so hearing each of these panelists speak about the ways in which their work, uh, interfaith work can can be transformative and provocative is is encouraging me. Um, so those are the things that are giving me hope is the opportunity that even in this dark time, that there are communities of, of light and hope and love. Thank you. Reverend Blackman. I was about to ask if there was any kind of order. Um, I, I would say three things um, and shout out to James Croft who was a part of my community. I saw him in the, in the Q and A. Um, my faith, my community, and my therapist. <laughs> I love that answer. I love that answer. Thank you. Reverend Dr. Zandra or, or Mr. Abdul Mateen. I'll go after my sister. Okay. Um. I, I actually, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm going to end up saying very similar, very similar things. Um, one is uh, truly the, the interfaith community around me, both locally and nationally, just listening to people be inspiring is very sustaining to me. Um, where, where there is the possibility of restoration, where there's hope, where um, there's a moment of love and compassion and, and justice. Those are very sustaining for me. Um, community, 
And it's amazing to me that community is still possible in this Zoom environment. Um, and, and then I'm just gonna say the same thing as, as Reverend Blackman, my, my therapist is incredibly sustaining. And I love that she just said that out loud. So it gave me the, the wisdom to say it out loud because uh, mental health right now, so deeply important. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Bismillah, I would say, um, I mean, I, I, I do my best to pray every day, my five prayers and get those in and any extras. I read Quran, I recite Quran every day um, and just make sure I get through that and try and understand what, you know, just what that lesson is. Um, so I would encourage people to dive into their practice and, you know, be serious about it and be um, focused on it. Um, the things that sustain me, I think, has been the relationship building I've done throughout this pandemic particularly with black women and with black men um, and deepening those relationships and really listening. Some of the people that, um, I always say that I was born in 1977 and people born my year, we have like a deep affinity for each other. Other years are very different. You guys are kind of like, I don't know, I don't know how, how y'all roll, but people born in 77, we just understand each other when we see each other. And there's been a crew of people that are my similar age. We've just found each other um, and really connected. And particularly, I think just anchoring our conversations in, um, the most rational and responsible people, people in our community, which often happen to be black women. And thankfully my mother is still alive. My sister passed away in December, um, 2019. So that was some like a blow cause she was a year, you know, her and I were like Irish twins. And, but just, the, just resonating with all of that. I just think that it's um, listen to the black women in your community, pay attention to what they're saying, you know, be quiet when they're speaking. And that, those are things when I've seen that the, that has become more to the center and that's given me a lot of hope. Thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end of our, our time together. Unfortunately, I think we could go for at least another 30 minutes and, and still uh, not have exhausted all that this conversation has uh, raised for us. But on behalf of the Office for Religious, Spiritual, and Ethical Life here at Washington University in St. Louis, I'd like to thank uh, each of you who have attended this panel discussion today, this webinar. I'd like to thank um, our co-moderator, uh, Micah, and I'd like to thank each of our uh, panelists today for this rich discussion. I'm going to turn the program over to um, the director of the Office for Spiritual, the Office for Religious, Spiritual and Ethical Life, Reverend Callista Isabel. Thank you so much. Oh, friends, my heart is so full hearing all of your re amazing reflections over the last 90 minutes. I wanna thank Dr. Priscilla Den white and Micah Salmon for moderating, hooray, thank you. And I um, echo your thanks to our amazing panelists. Today, I heard the strong call to get to work, to reflect, but also get to work. And so here we go. Um, we are so grateful for our partners, the Interfaith Youth Corps, the Interfaith, Interfaith Partnership of Greater St. Louis, who share our similar passions for this work and thank each of you who have tuned in today to be part of this conversation. Thank you, thank you. We are signing off, have a good night and carry on. The work goes on. <laughs>